Hi guys, uh, I am online, but give me just a moment. I want to make sure all of my settings are right for you. Good afternoon, this is Tony Leonard standing in for ZBrush Live on this March 28th, Saturday, 2020. And I hope everybody out there is doing okay. I'm um, staying indoors, heating uh, public uh, um, notifications to stay indoors and or stay in good health. And um, give me just a moment and we'll get started. Still trying to figure out some things. Give me one second. Ooh. Sorry guys, I just want to make sure that I am correctly streaming with this correct stream key. If you're not reading me, uh, let me know in the chat. There we go, I think we're actually in there. I am going to try and make sure that you can read me on YouTube, Twitch, and all of the sort. Let me just, um, yeah, there we go. Get all the pertinent chat stuff set up so that I can answer questions from you guys. Um, ooh, that's no good. make sure I can get everything right because I want to be able to see everyone and answer questions. Ah, there we go. Though I think the title might be slightly off. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's get started. So I have a lot to talk to with you guys today about. Um, I have, if for those that have been following my ZBrush live streams, I have been somewhat on a journey um, for some time um, creating a project in Unreal. Uh, and I've been using a, a variety of software to do that, namely, um, especially for a lot of different props, character items, and also characters themselves. I've been using ZBrush with a combination of other things. So I wanted to kind of um, bring you guys around and kind of talk about what it is exactly that I'm building and how I integrate ZBrush into that because, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are curious to try and use Unreal yourself and maybe I can sort of share some of my um, growing pains going into it um, and trying to study Unreal and, and be able to, you know, um, bring some things to light in it. Um, just to, to make sure, let me make sure that I, everyone can see my screen. Uh, doop, there we go. And video capture. Screen capture. There we go. All right. So just as uh, before we get started, let me pop up and see the rest. Sorry, I forgot to start it up as I was coming online. I need all the good stuff. 
Yes. Can you see my screen? Actually, just to... Uh... Ah, sweet. All right. Do Actually... Let's see. I don't always see things in real time, <laughs> but I'm trying to watch the stream and watch questions and open up steps. So just give me one second. Uh, oh, I need to upgrade this ma this machine. Sorry about that. Okay, so we have ZBrush 2020 open, uh, and I also have Marmoset open. I kind of want to open some things that uh, I want to show you. So <clears throat> kind of on the ZBrush side of things, there are some things that I've been working on. Um, and I'm going to pop those open and show you a few um, files that came out of ZBrush. And I'm actually going to also probably try to open, let's see if I can open up uh, the model itself. I'm going to grab something for starters. Because um, I have been modeling for months and um, I have sort of kept track of a, an archive of uh, different stuff that has gone into a, a project. Um, but first, before I open anything in ZBrush, let's jump ahead. I'm going to show you guys a few things in Unreal. Um, now I'm going to surf around this, and actually on my machine, I have an Xbox One controller that I have using its um, micro USB plugged in uh, to my machine, and so that I can surf around this scene. Uh, I'm going to go full screen in Unreal by pushing F11. Actually, I'm going to click in the viewport and push F11. And so you guys can see, or should be able to see, exactly the same thing. Um, so I wanted to talk about some of these as I take you guys on a tour. I'm going to point down here, maybe swoop down here, bring it down to our main square. There we go. And have a look around. It's a big set that I'm building. Um, and talk about this project a little bit. So I'm trying to create a, sort of a digital filming space where I can come into Unreal and be able to shoot certain scenes that I've been um, working on. You know, it's a little small like cinematic um, projects, um, just basically presenting a project that has motion uh, presented as concept art, right? And so I started using Unreal uh, along with ZBrush and some of the more useful spots that in fact I think um, probably for some previous streams I took you guys through some of my model building process for some of these props like for example um, using ZModeler for the buildings um, where I created some general shapes um, not only in ZBrush but also in Blender uh, 2.8 and created some small simple structures that would be able to have like a few accessories on like if I used Kitbash or I built some custom uh, parts to actually stick on to um, various structures that I would build um, and then I would move on and work towards importing those into Unreal and so today I'm going to show you a little bit about how I went through this process so I'm just going to kind of zoom around here in the scene maybe come around to the other side of the block um, a lot of these uh, props, buildings, uh, street lamps, the side curb, uh, little parking meters there that, as you can tell uh, probably from their shape language, were heavily inspired by one of my favorite films, Blade Runner. And um, I've been sort of uh, working on this little sort of narrative where, you know, I'm taking a sort of look at a city that is on Ganymede and you know sort of just as an idea and concept and so I've been working on blocking that out and um, adding you know some really fun stuff like um, various you know mechs that I've designed um, over the last couple of months um, over here if I go into the square there's the bubble pod lander that I created uh, and also the space what I call the space truck <laughs> which is just like a cargo truck uh, that I have in this scene parked in a few places, but all of this was mostly created between Blender and ZBrush. And um, there's a lot of prop making. There's a few other guest models that I've included in this. Uh, so you'll probably see a few little pieces of, um, every once in a while I've been asking some friends and fellow uh, concept artists to 
uh, you know, if they had a model or something that w they would love to see filmed or something like that, uh, to join me and, um, you know, maybe donate a model or something. And I've had some great uh, success with this. In fact, uh, with uh, obtaining a few meshes from Mike Nash, um, also from Edon Grazui, and um, a few other friends, my friend Odell. Um, we we have, have just like a cadre of friends that have donated some models, including uh, Joshua Cotter, who uh, did his own version of a really great uh, spinner car from uh, Blade Runner, uh, not just of his own de design. Um, that was really cool, so I have the, it as a prop. Uh, some of these texture-wise, I'm still working on um, to create, you know, sort of like a, a better environment. But really, right now, I'm just spending a lot of time trying to block out. And uh, let's just for say, uh, let me walk around this and, instead of zooming around with the camera, and we'll take a closer look. So I'm going to go ahead and hit F11 again and come out of full screen in Unreal. And I know this is somewhat of a departure from uh, ZBrush, but there, there's so much that I have to talk about with you guys as far as using ZBrush to process some of your models and sculpts to bring it into Unreal, that um, get, re get ready, and, <laughs> and if you're watching, take a few notes. So I'll try to go through this and make sure we, we cover a lot in two hours. Okay, so uh, on this one here, you know, I have like a main square, and so I want to walk around this and show you guys a little firsthand uh, via the, the third person player. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this. And as it plays, there we go, there's our character. And I've chosen, I have a few different uh, third person players, but um, this is the most working one that I have. In fact, it, it takes a lot of um, setting up uh, some, some nodes and some blueprints, um, all of which are pretty much you know accessible and very easy to learn about because there's so much content um, either, either from Unreal and Epic Games uh, down to you know enthusiasts and professionals that have made other videos so there's a lot of information out there on YouTube you know for the more simple stuff but um, I'm gonna go ahead and hit F11 again uh, let me just click there and F11 and so I have a third person here and um, thanks to my partner um, <laughs> Bezos Chan who who goes by the moniker Bezos Chan that's not his real name but Bezos uh, is a is a great kid who um, gave me a, a lot of help understanding some things in Unreal, and he's kind of partnered with me uh, to sort of build some of these experiences. So um, yeah, this is just like the the sort of common noodle bar scene area. I have some actors here, and along with um, talking about ZBrush and Unreal, uh, there's many other things that I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to probably touch upon using Mixamo, uh, Adobe Fuse for just creating some like uh, extras and or you know background people. Um, but I'm also going to talk about doing some custom sculpts using those tools. So pretty much this is kind of how it breaks down. Uh, a lot of times when I do model making for this project in Unreal, I start off by doing some sketches in ZBrush or Blender and start creating objects, either hard surface objects or character objects. Uh, and some of those characters I will either sculpt up from ZBrush, you know, like 100% by, you know, either getting like a base mesh and working from a base mesh and, and building that, that character up. Uh, and then sometimes, in some instances, depending, I will use Instalod to create um, sort of like a game ready mesh that's heavily triangulated but optimal for you know just comping a character down and getting them into the engine. Uh, and so that's a lot of what you see. Uh, so that, like I have a few characters here. This is like a, an, older, uh, an older version of one character that I'm still working on. I'm actually gonna talk about in a minute. It's the, the VR Ganymede chick. And uh, then there's the astronaut pilot, the player itself. My player uh, is a character of mine called uh, Oyabun, and he's a cyborg, of course. And let me just, uh, I'm gonna hit V on the keyboard. I've actually set up um, sort of a personal customized third person so that I can look in the first person and then look also closer. I'm gonna reset it and zoom in a little bit and then first person view, right? And this way I can sort of check some details um, there really isn't a whole lot of uh, lighting yet set up. In fact, these are still very rough 
But just to show you an idea of um, how this was put together, a lot of these props have just been placed um, along the grid, uh, spaced out kind of to some ideas that I had in Marmoset. And so I'll use Marmoset as sort of like a blockout tool. And additionally, for those users who are using Marmoset, there is a way to you know work from ZBrush and or other apps, bring those into Marmoset, set up your render, and then transfer a lot of those items um, over to Unreal. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. But um, it's a fully, you know, I mean, a lot of these props have a lot of details just to show. Um, I have used a combination of using Mega Scans by Quixel, uh, additionally using um, Substance Painter, Quixel Suite, and the brand new Quixel Mixer 2020. I'm using it all, all of them. In fact, um, some of them I'm using in succession with each other or in conjunction with each other. Um, just so that I can, you know, have lots of tools that cover, you know, what I need to do very quickly. Uh, and some of those maps can be also transferable. Um, I'm still working on things like physics, like if you watch the box here, if I bump one of those crates, one of Edon's crates, uh, they will bump and topple over. Uh, unfortunately, they don't open, but you can turn them around and push them over and do that sort of thing. Sort of like a, a loading cargo scene. There we go. I bumped it. It's flipped over. Can't help it now. Anyway, but uh, let's go over to a few other things. Like, um, I'll look at the mech here. Bubble Lander mech. Got some LEDs here. All of these were rendered inside of Marmoset. Uh, the graphics for the LEDs are from a set that I created, which are transparent PNGs uh, placed on 2D planes. Uh, this model particularly had a lot to do with using um, not only ZBrush, uh, actually one of my own kit bashes that I made in ZBrush it stands for a lot of the parts of this Mac, but there are a few other parts that I actually built for it and some that I kit bashed. Um, and then I textured it in Quixel Suite and Substance. Uh, probably Substance, <coughs> I do a lot of work in the Substance because it's just um, easy to do a lot of uh, decal stamping. And so like even if I prepare maps from another place like uh, Quixel Suite, uh, I can come back into uh, Substance, drop in the same maps, uh, and do a lot of easy decal stamping for extra details. So a lot of these props, uh, you know, very easily are either made in ZBrush or um, by by way of using the, the Z modeler. Um, and there are a few kit bash pieces, like uh, certain things like the, the noodle bar. This was actually a kit bash 3D piece, which was been which has been totally customized uh, texture wise and so as a good example you know this is a scene where you know you just add a few particles you know, uh, and, it, and it and maybe the emission stuff comes together and it really starts to come into life you know once you add some characters uh, these guys uh, the the what I call ramen nechans they're they're like the waitresses of the ramen in the sushi bar here in the middle of the square they were made in Mixamo uh, very quickly and that's something also I'm going to be uh, going through and discussing. I'm going to take a little jump across the street here. Let me jump across over the ship just so you can see some extra detail on top of things. have the mech tank here. Oop. We got to jump again and get up there. I have a extra high jump set so that I can sort of um, move through the scene uh, and take a look at certain things and details. Uh, close up but this object has a rig uh, and it will eventually move uh, not yet for the ship or the bubble lander but I'm gonna take a little quick jaunt over here down the block and go to the police box a little station back here and you'll see that there is yet another set of mechs back here and these were done with Z modeler uh, quite some time ago, actually a few months back. In fact, I think I touched upon this in a ZBrush uh, live stream several months back. Um, so maybe if you take a look on the archives for Pixelogic ZBrush Live, you might be able to catch a stream or two where you caught me building this thing. Uh, but for the most part, this was all just like a, some personal kit bashes, some box cutter with Blender, uh, ZBrush uh, and ZBrush modeler, uh, or Z modeler. Uh, and then, of course, you know, done up in Quixel Suite, Substance, you know, with a lot of the decal work being done in Substance.
right? And so let's take a little quick run. I'm gonna skip ahead really fast. Let's go back here to the corner. There's some interesting stuff back here. So I have another separate street here uh, that I'm setting up. Um, a few cars along the road. I uh, borrowed a prop from Blade Runner, <laughs> actually one that I purchased via CG Trader, but uh, giving sort of a, a head nod to, to Blade Runner, I, I have a few props that are very much inspired by it to sort of capture almost like a sister universe kind of look. But anyway, so back here we have uh, parked in front of a few buildings. Um, one of my larger ships that I've created for this project, uh, I call it the Space Bus, but it is a full like carrier dropship where most of my, my little Titan Trooper guys end up jumping out of. So I'm going to go along and look at the surface of this. So close up, some of this, you know, the, the detail holds up pretty good. Um, I did have a few problems baking uh, where every once in a while you get a little bit of normal burn. Uh, this actually had to be modeled and baked out in chunks uh, because the entire thing itself uh, would have needed a lot of uh, selection sets or maybe texture sets to, to bake. So I worked in modular sections like the engine pods, uh, the command pod, center module, rear engine, um, just one piece at a time uh, and textured them in Quixel Suite. And so they have a full range of like PBR maps um, to look at. But sooner or later I'll have these guys probably lighting up their engines and I've been running tests for a long time now so um, probably I could put this on a path and have it fly over the city. Sort of the same uh, would be for the larger ships that you see off in the sky and maybe for the larger gunship that you see docked over there at the side of the building. So there are about maybe three or four ships for this project that I've created, plus the landers there, uh, some of the cars and every once in a while, and other stuff like that. Um, I'm going to come over here and take a look at this character. This is one that's a real beaut. It's, um, it was designed by uh, Mike Nash, um, and he did a, a nurse, that he, a futuristic nurse that he called the Corona Nurse, inspired by recent events. Uh, and so I also added a, a pod. Unfortunately, the, I did something to change the material of one material for this glass, and so I'm still working through it. It's supposed to be more of like a frozen uh, glass with frost on it. Uh, I think somewhere maybe one of the opacities got messed up, but uh, there is an actual body on the inside of that that uh, looks sick. It's supposed to, so it's supposed to be sort of like a med pod sort of thing. And um, yeah, still have to come through and set up some lighting because some areas are still pretty dark, but working through it. Here, let me come up here and jump up to the side of a building just so we can see some vantage points. Oh, didn't make it. There we go. Jump one more time. And so really what you're seeing is probably something like this. So we have some details on top of the buildings. Oh dear. I fell off. Oh well. Let's come back over here. So I'm going to escape from the third hit escape and come out of this and just kind of go around a little bit just so you can see. So from the outside it doesn't look like much but these are months of models. Um, some that are experimental as I've been trying to work out different ways of um, baking uh, and so uh, while I do bake some things in ZBrush, a lot of times I use a few other apps. Um, namely, those that I'm going to name are uh, Nald, which is a handy little app, not too expensive, but it, it's a great baker um, for producing some procedural maps. Of course, you can bake some maps in uh, Substance. Uh, all Both of these methods I'm going to probably run through here shortly. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, yeah, today is going to be a busy one as I'm going to try to take a huge chunk and explain it. Uh, but I just wanted to go through and give you guys sort of a tour and and show you sort of what I'm building uh, and why I'm talking about certain methods or workflows as I'm building this, right? So the set is only like about maybe four or five blocks um, in a square, uh, the larger pieces being the wall, uh, which is sort of like an atmosphere wall, 
around this little town. Uh, and in the, the main chunk of floor, which was the city, you get maybe one, two, three, four, four blocks wide. Uh, and then you have the sort of Tyrell inspired pyramid back there as our backdrop piece. And so it looks strange when you back up and look at it, but I mean, to follow the illusion, pretty much, you know, you have the highway piece here which runs off to the end. Uh, we have a little bit of uh, maybe like some um, uh, like fog set up with a fall off uh, so that we can sort of, you know, get some some unclear depth at the end. You know, like it just, the, you wouldn't be able to tell that the, the freeway would cut off so abruptly. Uh, and so, you know, it has at least in its atmosphere that working for it. Uh, in the streets, there's a street tile, and then the actual street itself. Uh, these areas are areas where I did use like a few tiles of mega scans, and um, I still have to probably fix some of the grid, especially where some of the sidewalk pieces kind of overlap, as they might have some display errors like that there, where they get a little a little jittery. Uh, but pretty much things are coming along, and let's get to how I built some of this stuff. So let me switch over here, I'm going to switch gears of 11 again and come out of the full screen of that. And just to kind of show you an organization of things, um, this is going to come up later, but I am doing everything in a content folder. Uh, and then I have some added things like, you know, regular, you know, other mannequins that I've used for the third person starter content, you know, maybe for some of the more basic particles and what have you. Uh, really what I'm working in is the third person, uh, actually, sorry, not that. Is it third person BP? Yep, third person BP. So this folder here is where I'm storing all of the blueprints, HDRIs, maps. In other words, the map levels that I'm working on in particular, um, you know, are all staged out in levels. Some of these have yet to be built and or are just test areas. So uh, sooner or later, I'll just probably clean up the entire archive and sort of trim down the fat of what I need and what I don't need. But uh, also a separate folder for meshes, a separate folder for textures. So each of these folders are a particular uh, folder collection for each uh, each item. So like say for example this would be one of the maps. I'll have to bring this off the second screen and bring it here. Uh, and so you can see how these are UV'd uh, and the map texture that goes over it always re-import them, save them, uh, look at them, and for some reason, uh, to some degree, make some settings here in Unreal uh, for the actual image map that you're using as a texture map, correct? So in other words, like a uh, color, emissive, uh, normal, um, these are actually packed uh, Unreal uh, maps. So generally what I get is a combined map uh, that has the ambient occlusion, roughness, and metallic already uh, merged in together uh, and so that I can recycle the map uh, when I have to plug it in uh, and then let's move over to the materials so a lot of times what I'm using is um, not just making a straight material but actually making a material instance and so I have one that is sort of templatized uh, for this project and set up but I'll show you what it looks like double click to open it and it'll open in a separate window uh, and then, you know, I just bring in the maps and in, into a folder and then I'll drag each one on each node. So in other words, just dropping the maps here, right? Uh, and then basically the structure for this is a little bit difficult, but what you, what you're looking at is the actual base color, metallic, roughness, emissive, AO, normal, and unfortunately, even though I bring in a height, unfortunately, I'm not plugging in this map just yet um, as I'm using it to sort of um, uh, just, you know, like if I will need later, because I think uh, Unreal possibly uses height maps a little bit different. Um, if anybody knows better, you can you can certainly send me an email or a message and, uh, and tell me exactly where it, it gets used. But in this project, uh, to date, I haven't, in, in any of the materials, I haven't really used the height that much. But I, I just plug it in just in case, you know, if there's some possibility that I can connect it, I'll use it later. But 
uh, mostly just normal AO, roughness, uh, emissive, metallic, and base color are all those. And then, of course, those have a few of their own individual nodes here that you can see. I'll kind of zoom in so that you can take a note of this or scroll back and scrub and take a look. But the, it's a pretty simple setup. Uh, there's, you know, usually like a perimeter, switch perimeter, switch perimeter false. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what this one is. Actually, I had a friend of mine set these nodes up. Uh, and so we made one material that we could sort of, you know, as I said, make a template out of. And then I could just drop new textures in and apply them. So usually when I go back and try to set up uh, material instances for a new model, I, I have just one general blanket uh, material already set up. And then I can just right click, duplicate, create a new name for the actual material instance, you know, per whatever the context of what I'm working on. And then I can shoot that and just drag and drop it onto the object, right? So let's... Um, Let's get to maybe perhaps making something and then bringing that in. So I want to show you guys one recent character that I've been working on uh, before I open it here. Actually, you know what? Let's open it up here. Again, I check Redux. Here. Huh? Is it a tool? It might have been a tool. Let's import a tool. save this on my other machine sorry I have more than one machine and sometimes I uh, <laughs> use uh, each machine for a different purpose give me one second here uh, let's just look actually you know what I have the proof of this so let's before I open it in ZBrush I'm gonna open it actually somewhere else right here so you can kind of see what became of it so I'm gonna open a scene and Let's go uh, back to our archive here, sorry. But if you guys um, have any questions or anything, if you're hitting me up on Twitch or Facebook, actually Facebook, I can't see the comments. Let me see if I can actually pull those up on Facebook. Blop. Just so I can get everybody here. Sorry to take a moment to do this. Um, and if you're just joining, thanks for joining. All right, cool. Looks like I'm live. Perfect. Is there meant to be a picture yet? Yes. It should be long be a, a picture. Anyway, let's go in here. Uh, bam, there we go. All right, now we're getting somewhere. Oh. oh, gotta go grab a mesh, I think. This is a difficult thing about working on more than one machine. <laughs> There's so much, like uh, I'll store a bunch of stuff, and I, I try to use Dropbox so that every place can get access to the same thing, but every once in a while, something will go up missing. So my apologies for pondering where something's at for a second. So give me just a sec. Ah, okay. It's just a texture or two. So you know what? I'm actually going to cancel this. Let's say no. Nope. 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 There we go. Alright. So it looks like when I, on my way in, I might have, it doesn't have the same path for a few textures for this umbrella here, but we're gonna hide this guy for a minute and I'll get to the to the crux of what I've been working on here. So in the last week, um, I've been working on sort of a, um, one of some extras, um, having a few more characters that I can put into my Unreal scene. And I've been working from uh, ZBrush and I wanted to talk about this model in particular. This model, I didn't sculpt all of it, 
Uh, in fact, actually, I purchased this model um, from a very cool designer, a uh, French-Canadian fellow, I believe. Um, his name is Eugene Fulkin, uh, and he does these incredible sculpts um, and sells them on Gumroad uh, for a female base mesh uh, and several different, you know, male and female base meshes for, like, the head, body, uh, you know, but he, he has a very stylized female that I, that I liked uh, the aesthetic of and uh, they're, they're very almost fashion like his sculpts and so I thought it would be very cool to do sort of a sort of a high fashion character that walks through the scene you know so that we could have like uh, different people in, in the set and so this female base mesh I kind of customized a bit so I took it into ZBrush uh, I sculpted up some boots uh, cutting the mesh off by the legs and adjusting my own uh, custom boots onto the character uh, keeping in mind height and um, foot position uh, and then I think I threw on an extra piece of bash here this is actually uh, a kit piece from Vitaly Bulgarov uh, just one of his ultra Borg pieces that uh, I fit, fit in it, it always I've been looking for a reason to use the shape because it always looks like a VR goggle to me and so it was a perfect fit in this case and um, followed by using uh, marvelous designer for the cloth and so you know <clears throat> as a, you look at this you think wow you know it's pretty dense mesh triangulated that is because um, this is actually a limbic data here uh, the mesh itself is an animated FBX and if I play it here I'll go full screen here get rid of our UI for a second line up the camera I'm going to hit spacebar again and just play this for you. And so I have what is a combined T pose to walk cycle. And then there's a step forward here. It's like a fashion crossed step to stop motion. Uh, if, you, if you're looking for it on, on Mixamo, you can probably find it pretty easy. Uh, and then, you know, of course, everything was textured mostly um, for the body of the girl in Quixel Suite and then also Substance Painter because I had to go in and do a little bit of painting on the mesh itself um, you know just for like uh, little subtle details like the boots um, the hair I had to grab a hair sample and just kind of you know brush it into the because it's mostly just like a hair helmet piece in three sections like uh, which I actually kind of altered and sculpted up myself a little bit um, and then the sculpt had a pair of underwear, and so the female the mo uh, base mesh was not, you know, totally nude. Uh, so it just, you know, texturing those up, and then it came to the cloth. Now for the cloth, I, as I said, I used um, Marvelous Designer, um, which is something that I'm still toying and learning with. Um, but let me see if I can open it up. I actually have. Marvelous 9 on one of my newer machines. Uh, I have two machines that I use as workstations. and uh, One has a more recent version of Marvelous and one has older Marvelous. This is the older one. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm going to be able to open it. But if I go back here and play this, um, basically what you're looking at is one model for the character and this is an FBX animations and it was combined so in other words you might have to go to a separate package like uh, Maya, Blender, uh, 3ds Max, uh, Cinema 4D if you're using Cinema 4D uh, and then you have to go to Mixamo and bring in a T-Pose uh, and then use that T-Pose and combine it together now sooner or later I'm gonna probably not today I don't think I'm gonna have enough time to explain today but uh, I'm going to probably take a simple run through uh, Mixamo uh, here in a few minutes and show you how I upload something and use it uh, coming out of ZBrush. Uh, but I, I want to go back a just a little bit further. Um, first, I need to actually get my hands on the tool of this. So I'm going to come back over to ZBrush. And give me one second. I actually have to make sure that I have this around to open locally. Let's see here. Ah, uh, that's just the boots. Let us try to... Looks like I have to open it in one spot, save it to Dropbox and open it up again. So I'm gonna give that a second, but normally what I'm gonna do is come into um, 
let's let's just find another mesh that I've already worked on. I'm gonna drop a star, a polymesh 3D star, and hit T, and use this to uh, because it's you know I think I've mentioned this before, but because it's already a, a polymesh 3D, uh, I'm just gonna import on top of that, and let me bring in one other character model. Uh, let's see, same spot. Where is my guy? We need character actors. Basic mail, T pose. Pilot. There we go. FBX. Where's the final stuff? We gotta find the final stuff. There's so many of these. Decal, bake. Nope, none in there. Expose two, three. I think this is the one. Okay, so I'll open this. Considering how much this is opening, this actually might be the, my high, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. Uh, did that say high in it? Nope. Uh, hold on, sorry. One second. Pilot enemy. No big. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. It should be two, three. But it didn't come through. All right. Sorry about that. Let me redo this. Ah, yes, okay. All right, so here we go. So um, for those that, that follow me maybe on Facebook, you might have seen me post um, at least a, a whip of this. And actually, I will probably try to post it to the Pixelogic site, but um, I did take a, f a small snippet of, of time lapse of this character, and this is uh, one that pretty much I used using Fuse with about maybe just a few kit bash pieces, like just the gloves for the hands and the actual boots for expediency. I think uh, this is one of the basic straps with inside of uh, ZBrush by default. Maybe the buckle there, I used a few of my own kits and maybe one other. And then a few stamps, the rest is alpha stamped and sculpted up. So uh, one piece would be just like the neck piece, it's maybe Dynamesh. Uh, the body was sculpted up in Dynamesh and just used that as a, just as a sketch until I refined it and cleaned it up a bit. And this is just like a medium cleanup, you know, just like a high poly mesh. I think if I was to look at this, you'd probably see it, it's pretty dense, right? So this is probably just my high that I used from decimation. Uh, and then from that decimated high, I took it and actually ran Instalod, and which crushed all of this geometry down um, and made it so that I could stick it into um, Mixamo. Now something like this, that, you know, high poly that would be dense, obviously you would have to Z-remesh uh, Z this, um, but you could probably break this down uh, either by using the decimation master if you don't have anything else uh, and that might be actually good enough uh, you would probably have to save the model from a t-pose uh, decimate it uh, and you can use some of the presets actually um, in the z plugins if you actually come down to I believe it's the decimation master um, and then just pre-process the dynamesh figure like the suit uh, and then I just dropped it down by probably running one of the presets. I think probably a nice good high, probably somewhere in the middle would be like the 75k preset, and you could run it. It would only probably take a few minutes. Uh, hopefully, uh, it depends on the complexity and the dense density of your your mesh. But you know, usually running decimation master at about 75, 35, or doesn't take too long. Thank God. So I, not sure you know for specs of computers, but. You know, for me, it doesn't. It depending on just it just really depends on the model, um, how how much it has to break it down, but uh, and how complex the part are because a lot of these, like if I do it as one part or if I have smaller bits and I run decimation only on the suit bit, 
you know, then, you know, maybe the boots would be, you know, maybe a smaller number, like 35. Just um, try to economize where you can so that you can keep uh, the mesh surface looking great. Because uh, obviously, if you're going to try to make it move in Mixamo, you know, it, it can't be broken down too much, right? But <clears throat> for that purpose, I'm going to try to come over here. And let's see. Let me find out uh, just really quick. I want to take a look and see which one I actually rendered out. So I believe... Here we go. Let's open this really quick and take a look. So both of these characters, the, both the girl and the astronaut here, they were done um, mostly in ZBrush and then moved directly from ZBrush into a, a, a multitude of things. But firsthand, probably ZBrush, uh, a few fixes maybe in Blender, uh, you know, because I'm using that more and more as a 3D package than I probably would Maya typically. But in some cases, I do use Maya, and still um, trying to use it for like a lot of UV measures and you know maybe some geometric fixes and sort of editing and that sort of thing. But this is how post Mixamo this model came out, and the texture was done in Crystal Suite again uh, with the same combination using uh, Substance. And in fact, uh, this model was put together in two different instances: the whole figure by itself. And then I made the dome of the character's uh, head, you know, like helmet, uh, and then used what is called an opacity map um, set here in Marmoset with a. Uh, the opacity map is plugged in down here in transparency under alpha map, uh, and then it's set to dither. So it doesn't always look, I mean, because of the dither quality that you get in the viewport. It sometimes looks a little spotty, maybe a little bit unclean. But if you were to render this, it actually looks really, really quite clean. Um, so much so, I'm going to show it to you. So the resulting thing, let's see, VLC. I'm just going to open up. It's probably still in my recent. Here we go. I'll show you guys this. And so this is how um, the result that I get from using Mixmo, right? And this animation is just rendered from Marmoset. Um, you can set some video capture settings for Marmoset. And so when you play an animation, it'll take the timeline, the linear timeline, and play it out and render it. And so if I pause here, you can see the glass from this, even though you might have like the tiniest bit of faceting, like just from certain angle, um, pretty much it's clean and a lot of the spottiness as you can see in the viewport of Marmoset is actually gone so it cleans it up quite a bit and it actually you know includes a lot of the nice you know reflections and whatnot you just wouldn't necessarily have the thickness to bring the convincing part that this is a helmet and there are side panels right it's very thin on the sides so you know, depending on just the complexity or how close that you come to the character, some things are not going to always have the most detail. But you know, I think probably if you pulled back and your guy, you had this guy as a, like sort of a, a character and prop somewhere, like in a pilot seat, um, it's not going to matter very much, right? And of course, I could come and use the same rig that is on this thing because it actually, because it's an FBX, it actually does have a rig in it. Uh, and the keyframes are pretty much like burned in, locked in, or, or baked in uh, to the file. Yeah, um, you can actually edit them. You can bring them into C4D or Blender or any place else. And like say, if you wanted to move the arm up and have it holding something, you could bend it and then delete all of the keyframes after, and then you know basically redo the transform of the the limb uh, for those keyframes. You can just kind of basically overwrite them, right? And so sometimes I've been able to parent objects to the hand in another package uh, and then have, you know, characters holding a prop or something like that or uh, holding a briefcase, umbrella, computer, device, something, right? And so that's how we use these. And quite simply, um, you bring this, I just do this for rendering just to, for look dev, but you could record a motion graphic piece, but you can also use this in Unreal. And so here's one way. So 
back in Unreal, you might see that I have other files in my outliner here. Uh, that's because I've saved other sets of movements, and so there are, are more than a few, right? There's running, there's piloting, you know, I may make a comp with uh, just a few for, you know, with the helmet on, off, um, and just, you know, as a design, I want to see it move so that I can tell, you know, if I, if I finish building this thing out, you know, what is it going to look like? Or, you know, I might want to use him in a, in a ship and complete the concept of a, of a cockpit scene or something like that. And so, you know, I have various uh, animations or poses. And some of these poses you can combine together, right? So in the case of the girl, girl with VR goggles, where did she go? There she is. All right. In the case of this one, there are two animation sets, the walking cycle and the stop, and then the actual T pose, which you would see at sort of like a break in between the keyframes when the, when it cycles, All right? And so when I set these up, these things up in Marmoset, the easiest thing that you can do um, is actually save a Marmoset scene. And if you were to go over to Unreal, um, you can actually import that scene if you have the Marmoset plugin um, installed. So if you've used Unreal before, if you use the Marmoset scene importer, um, quite simply, it's pretty cool. You can just uh, hit import and then choose like uh, your actual file. So like, let's say, uh, not that one. <laughs> uh, let's go to another one. Let's see. If I was to grab this, I could just simply select the scene with the two girls and bring it in. I'm not gonna do that right now, actually, but that would be how you would do it. Um, you could just import the entire scene. But I wanna forewarn most of you that try to do that uh, straight out. Um, because every mesh that you have in a scene, whether you hide it or not, it actually reads the entire scene in Unreal. And so you want to try to make sure to knock some of these down. Uh, like I would just make one file that's like a master where you're doing all your rendering stuff. Uh, and then move over and make a duplicate file, open it, and just knock it down to what you want. So I'm actually going to do that now. I'm going to actually save this as, save scene as, and make a copy. Uh, name it solo so just for the one girl and it'll be a TV scene and I'll say save and then let's see I think I want to use this one in Unreal so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit control F to focus in on it and then I'm just gonna go through my t scene and delete some stuff that I don't need like I have extra copies of uh, the girl in this file um, where I tested various motions beforehand. Actually, I don't need that one. But if I played it, it would just be like the normal walk cycles, various walk cycles, various instances, maybe talking on the phone. Uh, the same walking step that ends these two figures that's in here. But pretty much this is the before and then now after effect of this. Um, I really wish I could open Marvelous 9 on this machine. Unfortunately, I have it on my other machine and I can't access it from here. I have like an older version, so I, if I open files from it, I, I'm, I would be trying to open new files from an older version, I think, unfortunately. But, uh, pure laziness. Didn't, didn't upgrade the, this machine, <laughs> unfortunately. Didn't get the love. But, let's knock some of this stuff off. So, I'm going to come in here and just take uh, the umbrellas out. I'll grab those later as a separate prop. I'm going to take out the fog. I'm going to... Let's see. Ah, that's the turntable item. So I think this can go. And this can go. Oops. This can go. Texting and walking can go. Talking on the phone can go. Oops, sorry. Catalog girl crossed. 
Okay, so I'm going to just delete everything and knock everything down to one instance of the girl. And then I'm going to save it. That one too can go. Okay, so all we have is our render, main camera, and sky. And even these num these items could come in. Um, so you could probably delete them unless you really need this the camera or the lights. In this instance, I don't think that I am. So I'm actually going to delete the sky because I believe it would import along with it. Right? So I'm just going to delete it. And it will stay probably at a default. Right. Okay. Pause this. Rewind it, and as you can see, rewinding, it's this T-pose here. I'm going to save it. And here's something of, a, uh, of an interesting thing. I'm not exactly sure if this character, I mean, of course, this character has a rig in it. But I'm not sure from Marmoset um, Toolbag if you can actually save the actual skeleton. I'm presuming that it would save the, the skeleton. And this is actually the first time I think I might have tried this with a character um, that I didn't have. Or sometimes I have to realign the, the rig to the T-pose if it gets stripped. But every once in a while, the keyframes for the FBX animation don't necessarily come out uh, by doing things this way. I would just directly replace it with an import of the model with its UVs uh, in Unreal so that I can get the same T-pose and then apply the animation track separate. Uh, and I'm actually going to explain a little bit of uh, the caveats be behind doing that here in the, the last hour or the second hour of our stream. So, um, but I'm going to try to save this and I'm going to try to import this into Unreal, right? So we've sculpted, we've spent it the, sky, the time sculpting, we've gotten it UV'd. And I just want to go back one more time uh, to ZBrush. Sorry to be so flip floppy, but uh, I'm gonna come back over here, turn off poly frames. And as you can see, there's no materials on any of this, uh, but if you ever need to, and I think um, a couple of other folks with Pixelogic have touched upon um, this uh, little trick. But when I do uh, character models like this, sometimes I wanna start with a sort of like a basic uh, color ID system, um, sort of using fill colors that I can actually drop textures in. And I think last time I used Quixel Suite in here, I might have uh, talked about it or touched upon it really quick, but I just want to explain it again. So when you have uh, separate pieces uh, to like a character mesh like this, and maybe you want to create some other selection sets, besides actually not saving down here in the export, when you have your topology worked out, um, if you have multiple parts of something that you want to kick out into one file, it, whether it be uh, probably an exported FBX or OBJ, um, FBX, of course, you can use, uh, where is it, where is it, FBX, import, export. Uh, you want to use visible, bin, and I believe it's uh, smooth normals or S normals. Uh, you want to have this checked on, these three items. Uh, that means that everything that is visible as far as a subtool in the scene uh, will be exported with your FBX. And I think with bin setting, it will also embed, like if you have uh, maps, I have, do not embed maps because I have no actual UV'd texture maps on this model. And I just want to put some, some blanket uh, vertex colors and use uh, to bake in some uh, V-coles or, or vertex color maps, texture maps after I UV things and after I get it baked because there will probably be like a comparison mesh or like a lower topologized mesh and then I'll use this as a high and do a comparison bake to where I get all of the high details onto a low top a lower topologized you know more optimal model right so a couple of different ways that I can save this high uh, one would be the FBX import export and then uh, we could skip over and do an OBJ, uh, which is probably going to be a little bit lighter uh, to transfer in some ways, um, and maybe a little bit easier to upload to Mixamo. So um, this is actually my high, so I'm, I'm just going to show this really quick. But uh, to do some color IDs, generally I'll go to polygroups, uh, and then I'll go over to uh, polypaint. And if I do auto groups, Hopefully, because this is so dense, it won't take forever to polygroup this, but I didn't exactly pick the lower <laughs> mesh, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry. 
so we're gonna just wait for a second. If it takes too long, I'll kill it and do it again. The quicker way. Okay, so it did it. It did it. So as you can see here, it put down various uh, polygroups to each different object. And I wouldn't necessarily use this, although I could, but uh, I, tr I usually try to do auto groups and then merge similar groups. So if anything has like similar uh, topology because it's been symmetrized, it'll actually kick the same polygroup color over to the other side. Uh, so I guess we could do this now. Merge groups with same vertex count, right? Sorry, again, mesh so dense, taking a minute. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta be careful of those those, those high poly meshes, you know? And moving them around, sometimes you can turn on the dynamic solo if you get a little sluggish, that sort of thing. But I'm just gonna try to see if I can merge the groups really quick. Not so quick. Is it gonna take a minute? This is where I'd be wary to touch it. Because if I touch it, maybe I could crash it. I don't want to do that. I'll take this moment to answer any questions. Oh, I did. I crashed it. I'm sorry. That's okay. We can start over again. There we go. Okay, we're going to restart that. Sorry about that. As a high that meshes, as a high res mesh, that thing is pretty dense. I, maybe trying something like, you know, trying to uh, merge all the polygroups wouldn't work out so great. So let's figure out a different way. So I think uh, actually on my lower that I had, um, I may have had a, a mesh that uh, is not as dense when I tried this. Uh, I saved a few different ones, but the more optimal is actually so low that it's just depending on the UVs in the map. But high-end sculpt, there you go. Uh, just uh, really quick, I'm gonna go through this again. You just uh, probably auto-group things. Um, if you have a lot of different pieces, you know, you might generalize and or individually select them and give them the same polygroup. Uh, or you could auto-group and then merge similar groups. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll come down, uh, what I was trying to get at was coming down to the poly paint menu and being able to colorize, I'll uncheck gradation because I don't want any, I want all sharp colors. I don't want any gradients in between, uh, like to bleed over or anything like that. I want a, a pure defined selection set. So what I'm going to do is poly paint from poly groups and then I'll take all of the poly groups and put a fill color. This, I think actually there's probably something underneath this that got merged from a copy uh, and probably is not at final what I used. In fact, I can kind of see it because it's peeking through the other one. Uh, actually, let's see here. I would probably have to separate this and, and then look at it. Yeah, But um, it's probably just doubled and that's why it's showing green with red is because there's two objects of the same objects. I might have accidentally merged this one. But concept wise, this is exactly what I do is um, just do like an auto grouping, merge similar groups, and then add fills to each different part, which would be separate geometry that you could then use uh, as a selection mask inside of either Quixel Suite or um, uh, in Substance, right? So once I, I'll put this and I save it as a, um, an LBJ, uh, like let's say for example, if I did that to the lower, let's take that and open it up somewhere. So uh, just wanna see really quick, hold on a second move oops didn't want to do that let me just make sure from which map did I use ah there we go 2-3-B alright so 2-3-B Here we go. Two, three, B, J. I'm going to look at where this is. Okay, so this 
is our more final broken down model that should have better topology. And I'm actually going to just, from a render perspective, bring this over to Marmoset really quick. I already saved this. And for a second later, I'm going to bring this into Unreal. So I'm going to put that away. I'm going to go here. And look at this. This is a new file. New scene. Nah, we're good. And now, uh, I'm just going to drag and drop from my folder. So as you can see here, like I have a, a folder that has just some basic bakes. Uh, and then it actually has the flats that were created from um, Quixel Suite. And there is where I have all of my albedo, AO, metallic, normal, roughness. And then the act just another extra T-pose copy of the map. Or the, of the mesh, excuse me. So this, literally, I could take and just drag and drop the mesh onto Marmoset. And without any details, pretty much this is what you're looking at, right? Uh, it only took about maybe 30 minutes or so to bake this down and also retopologize it using um, Instalod. And I used Instalod uh, Studio XL. Um, I know some folks are probably still trying to get their hands on Instalod, um, but I know that they that you sometimes they have a program where you have to apply for a, a seat license uh, or an evaluation copy. But I would uh, refer you to their site. Um, and try to look up some information on how you can get your hands on it. I'm not even sure if it's sold yet, but either way. Um, but yeah, the low uh, details as far as like uh, the basic mesh uh, with uh, normal smooth, this is what the sculpt looks like. And what I'll do to prepare this for Unreal is generally I'll just from Go make an Unreal template material inside of uh, Marmoset, drag and drop that to the mesh, and now I can start bringing in some of my other maps that I've baked out. So after I've textured this thing, I can come and bring in Albedo. I can come and drop in an occlusion map, AO, there we go. Metallic, normal, that's where a lot of our detail is gonna sit. All right. And because of the specularity, it's using PBR and uh, metalness looks really shiny like metal material. Uh, it needs, of course, roughness in conclusion. And there we go. That is the unhelmeted version of the pilot. And that's all the maps. Uh, maybe an emissive map here and there that I think I might have added later. Um, probably have that sitting in a different folder. But pretty much the basic map set is like this. And I'm going to put some light on it so they can see some lighting scenarios a little bit better. And you can crank these lights up using brightness. Maybe with a contact refinement, you can turn it, get some something a little bit different. Kind of like that. Right? So then, so, so then <coughs> this is the more textured like final look of something you know you get it textured and you say okay well now we need some movement right so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually flip open up a new browser and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to open up Mixamo now, Mixamo is a free service that you can use um, for those of you who subscribe to Adobe you know, Creative Suite or anything like that, or if you have a, an Adobe account, um, Mixamo is pretty much free, right? So, uh, but you just have to have an Adobe account, right? So if you log in, I'll log in. Oop, hold on. There we go. Okay, and so for animation, most of these are the animated, um, you know, mocap data. These are actually taken from from motion capture data. 
and they have you know a different a bunch of different things that you would find handy uh, walk cycles walk cycles with attitude fashion walk cycles idols uh, fighting fighting poses and usually these managing mannequins sort of match up to unreals right uh, so what I want to first do is actually upload the pilot character that we were uh, working on and I want to do a few things to it uh, and I know that there's probably a little bit of a minor error that's going to happen when I choose certain poses because uh, one thing to discuss is that a lot of these characters some of them have and have not been properly weight painted and so you get some varying results when you use something from Mixamo uh, so just to, to forewarn you of that weight painting is sort of a, uh, a type of RGB value that you could apply to a model where it implies stiffness or softness of an object so like say if you have wrinkles or body jiggle or uh, clothing or um, you want something to be hard because it's a hard surface item then you paint it one way <laughs> or one value and maybe the other you add a value for softness right and so sometimes it really helps to where you know certain spots under the arms are going to flex and bend maybe around the elbow or shoulders uh, and you know sometimes in the joints or, or knees they, they might look a little wonky or it might start to intersect so I'm gonna try it just raw and then I know that I can just weight paint and fix things later by just going into a different package and applying a little bit of uh, weight paint but in this instance pretty much I just want to capture the movement so I'm just gonna upload the character uh, we've saved an OBJ or something like that so I can just take the OBJ that we had in Marmoset and drag it over here and it will upload it and you can do this sort of thing just conceptually for like um, any of your ZBrush character sculpts it's really nice to see sometimes uh, characters in motion right you get sort of like the full result of a, a concept that way so I'm gonna actually have to make up some points as to where I'm gonna put these but I'm gonna follow just general landmarks so I'm gonna hit elbows and probably right around there on this suit forearms a little short but probably right around there I get up to the chin and for his chin I'm actually give it give him uh, his chin sort of here right where the sort of chin of the neck brace would be for the helmet and then wrists put those here knees uh, probably right where the pockets are somewhere right around there groin pretty easy to find if he didn't he'd have some problems anyway I'm gonna post that right there and hit next and so what it's gonna do is it's gonna auto rig it will take a minute or two and maybe go through this actually it probably won't take a two a full two minutes but it you know sometimes it can uh, just as a warning if you try this with characters um, usually things that are in a basic sort of humanoid form or rig uh, would work you could actually apply a rig if you're you know if you have some experience rigging you can apply a rig and actually upload the rig and get the mocap data you know straight off or you can always take a character and t-pose it when you after uploading um, to Mixamo and you can use that as a reference t-pose and then get movements later so one of the first things that I do especially when I upload to Mixamo is I come uh, just make sure that it's working right all of the, the points like the wrists and stuff are are reacting right I'll hit next and it'll bring it in to this little viewport here off to the right and one of the first things you'll notice is it's in a t-pose right but just to make sure that I have this it might store this t-frame in like the first frame or so when you run your animation even even though you probably won't see it it saves a different track with just it on it I believe but generally I'll just hit the search field and hit t-pose do a search and it'll be the first one and when I apply that one you see how the hands actually rose a little higher you can adjust the posture and I'll leave that at 100% and the overdrive really you don't have to mess with this this is mostly for stuff that has movement this is just a static pose 
but what it'll do is it'll give us a uh, static pose for our T pose skeleton and that will be the main reference anytime you use Unreal. So say for example I go back over to Unreal and I look at uh, some of my characters in my mesh folder. Uh, third person. Oops, sorry. It needs to be that BP folder. There we go. Uh, and I'll go into the meshes. And let's say I try to find the pilot for this. Uh, pilot mail suit. There we go. Hey guys, out. Sorry, <laughs> my boys just busted in here. It's been a little close uh, for the call because everybody's, you know, working from home and staying at home because of Corona. I hope you guys are doing the same and being safe. Anyway, uh, as you can see here, some of these have been imp imported already, and I'll just open up the T pose. Uh, this one here, I believe, should be the mesh, the, the skeletal mesh. And uh, let me bring this over here. And so this is how it would render out in Unreal. And um, so just the T pose, and you know, I can view it here in a separate viewport just so that I can put all of the material slots back in. Um, generally, when you bring this in, you'll import it and it'll come in as a T-pose and it'll read the skeleton. So you'll be able to you know, make adjustments to your skeleton or maybe parent an object to whatever bone uh, is associated with where you wanna say put like a flashlight or an electronic device or a weapon design. You, know, you have to actually attach it to the hand. Uh, so sometimes you need to click on the various bones and then go to socket and enter the name of the bone and then you can basically parent it. Uh, to, you know, like a separate object to that mesh. But pretty much, we're gonna start from a T-pose. Uh, the T-pose basically is the base, and then Hi. the other meshes, Hi. you're gonna have to, the other meshes you're gonna have to bring in by adding um, an animation track. Sorry about that. So once you have the, the animation track, you're gonna drop in the animation track separately, and then you're gonna have the T-pose. So, Let's see. I'll open one of the animation tracks. And as you can see, excuse me for a second. My apologies about that. My boisterous little boy ran in here. But. Uh, as you can see, there is an animation track, and so that's what all of these at the bottom of the uh, shelf here are. Uh, a lot of these green ones are, they're labeled just, you can see, see like just a little bit of a sliver of a color, and there's like a color coding on all of these thumbnails. Those are to define whether these are skeletal meshes, uh, physics, or animation blueprint. Uh, I believe physics would be, uh, let's see. Where is the physics track? Let me see here. Ah, here we go. Physics tracks that look like this. And basically these are the physics for like uh, clothing or collision items. Um, you know, you bumping into something, it has like sort of a capsule bubble around it and th that would be its, its physics field or area, right? And so each segment or each bone of these has a physics uh, capsule around it, right? Uh, and then of course the animation track is just the skeleton and of course the tracks that it got from the FBX animation. And so you would use different animations to bring them in. Uh, one thing that I will say is if you're bringing in extra animations besides your T-pose uh, so that you can use it, you may want to be able to come and say download, oops, let's say, let's get a walk cycle. I'll grab a walk cycle, I'll do it in place, and there's my guy walking, right? And I like this one, it's pretty cool. Maybe I might wanna slow it down a little bit. Maybe a little faster. And I can change the arm distance. Make him look swole. There he goes, he's pumped, he's ready to fly. He's going into space, man. Look at him, he's got attitude. Right? You can set the timing and the trim of the, the total frames. 
but usually I leave this at default. But one of the things that I wanted to tell you was, besides setting it this way, uh, when it comes to downloading, if you're working inside of Unreal, uh, you may want to grab a T-Pose with skin. And as you can see from this, this download settings here, I'm going to be using FBX. You have your choice between FBX, FBX for Unity, Collada, um, Data. I think just those three, pretty much. But FBX is pretty universal. 30 frames per second is probably uh, good, unless you're doing something super high res and you need lots of keyframes baked in. Then you could probably skip up to 30 or, or, or 60 even. I usually use mine at, at just about 30 frames per second. Because uh, I have a few partners that do some animation stuff for me. And when I make animations, I, I will give them some. And I say, hey, how do you want it? And it's 30 frames per second. So it's pretty pretty standard. Um, and then with skin for the T-Pose, without skin for some of the animations. Because basically what we're just going to be using is the actual animation track. Uh, and then the keyframe reduction, generally, I have set to none. And then I can download this, and it will download an FBX animation for me. And then of course I can open it. Oh. Blurp. Sorry about that. Let's try that again. <laughs> There's the walk that I made. I'm going to see it in the uh, downloads folder here. I'm going to copy it. Or you know what? Actually, don't need to copy it. It's just for demo sake. But let's just throw it into a render, right? So I'm gonna before I go to Unreal, I'm going to try it out here. And we'll throw the walk in here. And I think I got it without skin. So as you can see here, without skin, it's not gonna look by, like much of anything but it does actually have an animation to it. And I would actually have to assign the movement of this to here. If I go back, here, let's go back. Uh, let's go back to Mixamo, if I can find it. Did I close it? I guess I closed it accidentally. Crap, sorry about that. Let's just reopen it. If I, if I reopen it, I'll show you actually a good thing. Because I saved a T-Pose, it's still there when I load the browser back up. Now, if you log out or time out uh, of your login for Adobe, sometimes it'll ask you to re-log in and you might have to re-upload this. But if you had already saved the T-Pose, uh, it's much quicker and you could just drop in the same T-Pose that you used before here and be able to just pick up some new movements so that's why I suggest you know one of the first things that you do is just go in when you log in to, to um, Mixamo is just to find the t-pose and then just grab and adjust your own t-pose and save it that way you can reload that same t-pose with its skeleton to Mixamo and be able to add additional movements at will right so now that I've got this um, Let's try that again. I'm actually going to go to the walk again. And I'll grab a different walk and I'll do in place. And that's probably similar to the other walk. And this time when I download it, I'm going to do it with skin uh, and save it out. So now, I'm actually going to delete this one, and I'm going to bring in this one. And so now, as you can see, this actually has a skin with it, and I can drop the same material on it, and if I hit play, you can see that the frames are in here. And you can, if this is a little too fast, you can always change the speed, maybe like a 0.5 makes it slow-mo and you can see your guy a little bit more clearly but at least this way you can have some fun at adding some motions to your, your designs you could try different textures uh, and sort of visualize before you put it in environment 
but you can also use the same uh, animations inside of Unreal. So as I mentioned before, bring in a T-pose, um, you know, that is the skeletal mesh. And in fact, if I wanted to, I'm going to show you how to import here. I'll just import, click import, uh, three, to be, let's see, actually raw folder directory, sorry, uh, 32B, just gonna find the same mesh as I used before, and of course if you open this, oops, didn't want to do that, if I just click open, here of course with the T-pose, I'm not going to actually follow through and hit import because, of course, I've already got a T pose in my of this character inside of my project. But uh, as you can see here under the options that you want, sorry, go away, Photoshop. All right, so uh, under mesh, you want to be able to click a skeletal mesh, um, and if you have any maps or anything already on the model, um, you can of course combine meshes if you need to be doing that or um, combining or, or actually creating a material and, and or material instance it'll do both uh, and you would just bring in the t-pose this way right and that will get it in but you would of course need your maps and everything as I was explaining so I'm gonna cancel that but that's pretty much how I got the t-pose in and then additionally when you add the animation so let's try hitting import again and I'll go over to my downloads folder where I just dropped, uh, just downloaded um, the two animations from Mixamo. So I believe it's uh, here. And this walking probably didn't have a skin. So if I import this and say open, it's actually just the skeleton itself because I didn't save a skin with it. And so you'll know that this just has the skeleton and the animation and the actual referenced pose is the actual t-pose skeleton so as i have the the, the pilot's uh, t-pose skeleton and if i select it it's using that as a reference for its animation track so if i import it then this is another walking and i can double click and open it and i'll bring that window over here and as you can see the animation has been applied and you're going to need all of those animations with their skeleton tracks, uh, the skeletal animation tracks, and then the actual skeleton T-pose mesh and, and actual mesh uh, for it in, in one, right? And so once you have that template down, you can then take these and combine, do some animation blending, maybe in an outside package and bring those back in. Um, or you could use them and set them up for your third person player. Uh, and in some cases you can use a character BP, uh, which is basically like a blueprint. So like if you're setting up your character to be the playable character, you know, you might need a, uh, an anime, uh, an anim BP, uh, and then you would plug that up to, you know, your sources. I haven't plugged this one up yet, but I'll kind of show you what another one looks like. Um, let's see, where's either Goro or... Oyabun. So with Spartan Oyabun, I have uh, various, you know, his character blend space looks somewhat like this. So in other words, you have an entry, idle, and movement node. And then, of course, with your movements, if I double click this, um, you can see, you know, around in the event graph, uh, in the movement states, you know, this is for the direction and speed and then the character itself, and then the output pose. Um, there is a video that very well captures explaining this on uh, YouTube, and I would refer you to do a search on, on YouTube on setting up uh, an NMBP uh, as well. Uh, there's a gentleman, I forget his name, I'm going to have to mention him next time, but um, there's a young man whose uh, YouTube video I watched, uh, exactly on setting up uh, your output animation poses and how to use Mixamo with that. So I do know that there's plenty of very easy to access information to cover that. Um, I'm going to defer you there because I want to actually get back to ZBrush a little bit and try some other things. Alright, so with our 30 minutes left, 
let me see if I can answer any questions. Um, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Let's see. I'm going to flip over to Twitch. Sorry about that. I had to I had a long discussion, and I, I might have skipped a few comments. In fact, I didn't know that the Twitch stream was having so many. Uh, yes. A Mixamo will auto-rig for you. It only takes about two minutes or so. Uh, yes, you might need a rig for some of these works. Um, it, generally, like if you wanted to concept something, like a character idea, and you wanted to give it some simple movement, Mixamo is a very accessible way to do that. And so that's one step past ZBrush that you could take your sculpts. And as long as it's like a manifold mesh, um, I wouldn't attach or parent objects to it until after you apply an animation. But in some complex cases, you can have like a base character mesh, which is just one manifold mesh. And then as long as you're familiar with parenting other objects or like uh, sub tools that are on the mesh, um, if you want to keep them in the same place, you need to parent those to the actual bone. So knowing how to work yourself around the hierarchy of your character might be pretty useful. Uh, for example, sake, um, I believe, oh, not that one. Here we go. So here's Oyabun's uh, character mesh, which wasn't a T-pose, I believe, at first. I think I had to do quite a bit to get it there, but he had his hands open. Uh, and I was able to T-pose uh, this later, I believe, um, and or work on it with a with a, a skeleton that was produced through Mixamo, even though he wasn't in a T-pose. It just put all of the markers that you saw me use at the beginning, and then at the other end, once it was uploaded, I made a T-pose right away. Now, because this has no normal, uh, no, no weighted, well, I don't think there's a weighted normal on it per se, but th there's no um, uh, weight paints on, on the object. I have to trust the weight paints that it already has or, or automatically generates. And so sometimes you get a little bending, a little stretching under the arms. But I, w I would only that or and or the chin sometimes to place, depending on where you place the markers, some areas might be susceptible to a little stretching and might look odd. But uh, if you are familiar or want to familiarize yourself with weight paints, uh, that is a good general way to fix some of those issues, right? Where you have deformity in the mesh and it looks odd or like it might sort of shorten or truncate the movement of the elbow and, and bend it up a little bit weird. Um, those sort of things you might want to look at. But generally, yeah, you can you can use it to uh, you can use it to, to do some pretty cool stuff. All right. So I'm going to close this up. I have a bunch of these. And I'll show you a couple of other ones that are in here. Uh, again, all of this stuff, all of it touched with um, ZBrush at one point. Um, and, and generally made in ZBrush uh, along with uh, Blender, right? Kind of split organics and hard surface, you know, per app a little bit, but ZBrush does do a lot of hard surface and I, I won't deny it for that. So, you know, Z Modeler can really help. Um, these buildings here, as I went back and I think about it, I think I showed you guys a little bit of the building process um, and, I, and I don't know if I will be able to get to it within the next half hour, but uh, these buildings, we'll, we'll take another stab at creating some buildings because I'm going to create some other environments and, uh, and I'll definitely show you this. But this is a project that I'll be probably working on for in the interim for, for several more months. <laughs> it's actually already slowly been collecting over a year as I've just been creating sort of a, um, a large... Uh, collection of different buildings, uh, props, you name it, uh, vehicles, mechs, all to go into the same space or universe, I guess you could say. But pretty much that is it. So let's say, uh, let's go back. Let's go back for a second. I'm going to go back to ZBrush and I actually want to see what is up here. Oops. No, I didn't want to, I didn't want to publish that. Okay. So let's see this. 
was somewhere in between and I actually as I said wanted to try and break this up I think maybe when I saved it some pieces got overlapped so I'm actually going to delete this go back a bit and pick for you guys a little bit better of an example out of those meshes so here just to hold on just one sec I'm actually trying to find the Z tool I put it somewhere and I don't know where I put it is that it that is it okay here we go sorry about that I was getting confused through my own archives I keep so much stuff and the similar names it's not good so good housekeeping is always always a good thing especially in times like this when you're presenting anyway uh, so I have the helmet piece here just to show you how this was built inside of ZBrush so I just made like a domed cap um, I think originally this might this helmet might have been sculpted from just like a simple IMM brush uh, just a primitive shape and a lot of times I use two shapes in here to create a lot of geometry for characters and stuff like that especially where I want to keep it quad at least for a minute um, the polysphere and if you hit M on any IMM you'll get the other brushes on the inside uh, I use the basic Q cube and uh, I believe the polysphere um, mostly because of the, them just being quads and it's easy to just quickly uh, subdivide it and sort of sculpt it up and so if I turn this off go here you start to see the guy underneath and of course all of the weird colors that you see or what I was talking about earlier um, using uh, the poly paint menu so it's sort of like a sub menu down here uh, on the tool palette and turn gradation off and then just poly paint from poly groups because if you see this I'll take and hide the vertex colors and show the poly frames this is a bit dense because this has been decimated already so this is probably my high poly um, and then I think I merged the body and all the rest and just had a separate helmet piece. But because of all of these having, you know, different poly groups, I'm able to quickly create, you know, just some uh, very general, like, um, areas for doing the, the color masks. And so, like, his eye pieces, little bits inside of his helmet ring there. I think I used... Uh, the remodeler just you know in the IMM brushes that I was just showing just create like a quick cylinder piece and then the glove went superimposed right over that and so it's not not too hard but the actual base mesh for this guy um, originated from fuse and I don't know if you guys have ever used fuse but I'm gonna pause ZBrush for a moment and I'm gonna actually open it and let's see let's close a few things just so that I'm not using too much too many resources. I'm going to close her and save her later because now that I have this saved, um, I can bring this into Unreal. Uh, let's see. What was I going to do? I was going to open up something. I was going to open up, go from ZBrush. Right decimated and so where was I gonna go I need to close that sorry I just got confused as to where I was about to go I was closing stuff because I, <laughs> I wanted to uh, maybe not bear my machine down too much and I forgot what I was gonna open uh, let's see we need the pilot and we need the pilot out of here so I have a retopologized version of this uh, and I was baking this kind of thing uh, with a few different uh, with a few different apps one I'm going to introduce you guys to is Nald and with Nald sorry it's a quick easy little app for baking it does some great stuff uh, and from ZBrush, all I had to do when I come over here is I'm, I'm just doing some like small procedural maps um, to sort of have a basis for when I go to Substance. Uh, you could do the same thing in Substance, uh, but sometimes 
And uh, if it's just a simple model, I'll use something like Nald, or if I want just like a really nice detailed bake for something simple, procedural, uh, I'll come over here. But once I open it, I'm going to hit Control B, and I'm going to mark up uh, my high poly. So here's where I need to pay attention and go find the actual right files for stuff. So, uh, yeah. I'm going to go looking through this directory and see if I can find it right. 2020 projects. Character actors, mail, T pose. And then we need our guy. Yep, there it is. There it is. There it is. Open. Actually, that I believe is the low. So I'm going to actually do the same for this guy and go back and load up the high. Sorry about that. It's probably going to be 2.2 FBX. I should have actually marked high on this so I could know. And for some reason I didn't. Or I think I when I made it in Instalot it just baked it right out and I didn't have too much of a high map. Let me try this one and see if it works right. Uh, I'll do a low bake just to process from the go. And uh, let's see here. Bopity bopity bop. Should be good. Now I need to actually add some maps. So I'm going to turn on aliasing, I'm going to do a low uh, 2048 bake, you know, which is just about medium res. Uh, anything lower would be not look so great, but I would probably go 24K is generally where I go with a lot of maps like this. So I'm going to add height, tangent space, object space, uh, skip derivative, and use uh, ambient occlusion, and vertex colors. Concavity, I'm not going to use a cavity map, but I am going to use the curvature map. Uh, and then ID, color, uh, material ID, it doesn't work exactly like the same as the uh, vertex color. Uh, vertex color will actually be our material ID, so I'm not going to choose that one. And then TS, uh, I think it's tangent space bent normal and uh, object space bent normal. I don't think I need these right away, so I'm not going to worry about baking them for now. Uh, that should be good. And then I'm going to pre-process them. And let's see if this works out right. Usually it only takes a second, although I don't know, I'm streaming, I'm using a few resources, it might take a little bit more. But that's pretty much how you would set up a bake, and then, here, if I put that aside for a second, and I go over here, and look at the actual maps that were baked the first time around. Oh, that's where I was, okay. So as you can see here, in the end, I have maps that came out of Mixamo for, this is actually just for the basic guy when I created him. Uh, and I used Fuse to create a sort of male base mesh that I could use. I just included no hair or, or any other you know, major features. I mean, you, you can pick sort of a, a human male and customize it a bit. And so it makes it slightly unique, which is great. Um, but I would use something for this like bake for baking only for the textures and then I'll come back over uh, see it is taking a minute sorry about that you know, these things happen 79 80 you would think with two 2080 supers it would be a little bit faster but sometimes it is not but it is a nice bake and so you can see there it's going through in fact I have my AO bake set pretty high so it's gonna take a minute for it its pass as you can see there we go all right and so we have our, our basic bake this is a the the UVs were done in Instalot as I said and so it does sort of like an auto UVing trick on it but as long as I have my high with the vertex colors saved into it I can bake my colors AO normal curvature, all the stuff that I'm going to use for PBR texturing and have those maps up front so that I don't have to bake or uh, bake again, right? Sometimes what you'll have to do is actually bring the model in, do a comparison bake within that software, and then, then you'll have your maps. 
sometimes I like to self-prepare and have those maps so I can take them into anything and try to texture them, uh, mixer, what have you, and so I can try different nice parts in between any of these shells, make it sort of look, you know, like it has different, uh, different uh, material breakups, basically, right? And I just drew like a, a loose fill or mask. Some areas like this, it may look a little dodgy where um, the object tried to interpolate the space in between what was applied on, you know, like the, the belt that's sitting over the actual mesh surface. And it looks maybe just like a little dodgy in between here, but these are things I think later we can probably bake later and, and add as a separate object if I was to redo this and tighten up the look of this character. But for you know comp purposes of putting it in engine and being able to see how it reacts and looks and lights inside of the environment, this is one way that I, I've been doing this uh, workflow, right? And so now with these maps, as soon as I take them, I can export them. So in other words, uh, say not TIFF, but maybe PNG, 8-bit, and then choosing an export path, saving them out. Um, you can just set this up, and then under the main, you could just um, choose your export name, like so pressure suit guy or whatever, the same export path where you're going to kick your, your maps out, and then you would just hit export, and it'll bake it. it. It's already baked, so it'll just save everything out as you wanted it, right? And then naturally, of course, if you came over to some place like Substance, you would then in turn bring the same model in Uh, driver and so you have to go through some suggested steps to set up uh, your TDR time values so that it could you know it won't time out in a render on your design so uh, this is an issue I would say be careful of uh, but yes follow the step-by-step -step guide that uh, substance algorithmic provides it will help anyway I'm not going to open it for now but uh, I'll save that one for next time because we have uh, a short amount of time but now that I have these bakes here um, what I can do let's just save a sort of like a test and I'll choose a path I'll make a new folder choose it and export it. It's saving pretty quickly because it's already done the baking. And now I'll just bring those maps up. And we could look at what came out. Okay, so you have your curvature this window curvature that's got to be height normal map occlusion normal and vertex colors and some of these you could probably edit and hand paint like I think there might have been um, part of the lip of the boot uh, at the ankle that poked through somehow or got distorted and there's a little bit of uh, material that's being mixed in between the selection of the suit itself and the actual boot somewhere. I think you could probably paint these out and get a cleaner selection, but I'll leave that to you. Alright. Uh, splices are you asking about how to get different look uh, different looking materials on your mesh. If so is that being done with material IDs? Okay, so material IDs. There's a couple of different uh, things with material IDs. I guess you could put vertex color in the actual material, uh, and then that could be used to bake a, a, a color ID map. Generally, what I do is I just do what I showed you in placing color IDs on a mesh inside of uh, ZBrush. In fact, it's, it's very quick for that because everything is based off of the polygroups, and I could just fill it by the polygroup, and then once I have everything UV'd, all of those vertex colors are going to be displayed in each island where I place them. Uh, and then you could use that 
I'm saying in Mixer, the brand new Mixer, Substance, and or Quixel Suite, and or any other texturing software generally tends to use those ba these basic sets of maps to start off with. Uh, I will show you how to do these uh, type of simple bakes to set up things inside of Substance if you need to do it there. Um, but just say, you know, from something quick inside of, um, uh, you know, from, coming from ZBrush, I would just, you know, use something like Null to, to bake it out really quick. Uh, there are a variety of softwares that I guess do this sort of thing, but those are the, the ones that I, I personally use quite a bit to do that. But um, once you have this uh, vertex color saved out on a color map, uh, which totally you can make this inside of ZBrush, uh, do not be fooled. If I was to, say, um, put a color map on this one here, you know, as a merged mesh or something, and I have all of my material IDs laid out. If I was to bring over the low and overlap it and then project the colors on, I could very much do exactly the same thing. Uh, it, it would just be like, it, you want to probably do a color ID from the high. So that's why I do one in my high mesh is I guess I do all of the color fills for color IDs in the high and then they get baked onto the low because if I just put them on the low, um, sometimes when they flatten out, the resolution is not all that great because of the actual you know, poly count and so you'll get some rough edges of things. So I just, I bake that color into the high and then have it bake off of the high onto the lows maps, right? I guess if that makes sense, <laughs> I should hope. Uh, and then, you know, basically I can use uh, a texture app. Uh, to fill it like um let's just say for example i'm going to close this i'll close uh close zbrush i'll kill it for a minute it'll come back don't worry and then um i will go uh open mixer and if you're using unreal um and you make a Megascans account, um, if you're using all of your maps inside Unreal uh, as an individual user, um, your Megascans would be free. Uh, there are some items in which I think you probably still get charged for if you use them outside of uh, uh, Unreal Engine, but um, if your sole purpose is to bake maps and use them in the Unreal Engine, I believe your Megascans would uh, be downloadable for free. So jump on it. And of course, Mixer is still in its beta, um, even though the new version, uh, 2021 one, I think, unless there's a one two that I haven't heard of yet, has just come out. And um... ah, yeah, you would get bleeding. Sometimes it, there's, there's some combination of that. Uh, in fact, uh, I believe it's pre-drag Presic 16. Uh, you are correct. So it just it, it just depends on some of the, the resolution. That's why usually, like on my high mesh, I make sure that I have my color IDs. So when I UV in all of the UV spaces, all of those colors are gonna bake in, right? On the vertex color layout, right? So once I have those, and then of course I just go to like a, a PBR texture, something like Mixer or Quixel Suite or Substance, and then I start putting stuff in. Um, here's one, for example, I had started working on this pilot. It's already pretty much set up, but I'll, sh I'll show you. Okay, so once you open Mixer, uh, if you wanted to open up like a character mesh or something like that, um, one of the things that I would do, oops, it's running Mix for the first time. Ah, oh, there we go. I don't think I completed all of the look of this one. I think I gave up on this one and started over, but everything in the file has been set up, so I guess I'll show you from here. But um, yeah, you can come in here, and on setup, you can select your resolution. So in my case, I'm using 4096. Uh, let's just start all over, right? I'm going to take all of this and just dump it.
All right, and so now there is nothing. And I would, I would be starting from pretty much like this spot, right? But there's a few setup things you would want to do. Uh, you want to choose your resolution, 4096. Uh, model settings, you want to say uh, custom mesh, and of course, pick that, and then pick the OBJ or FBX that you have. I believe probably OBJ would work pretty good. Uh, OBJ and FBX in some ways can be triangulated, uh, so you know, like non-subdivided geometry might work as long if they have UVs and stuff like that. Uh, and then I would just rescale, just make sure you're to set your scale to one. Uh, once you're done with that, you want to come in and also add your albedo, and you can just hit load and load it. Metalness, roughness, all of the maps that we were baking out uh, of Nald and or the like uh, placed here so that we can begin some of our work. And then we could just start making layers, choosing different materials from mega skins. Like, let's say, for example, uh, can I make things like a leather? What is that? Is that like a rubber? I think it's like a rubber. And then, of course, I could add ID mask. And then all of these cor correspond with the colors that I used in my um, map. I believe it's eight, you can see these. And so it would load like this. And then you could use the select, like bright pink. And then one goes back. And whatever what that color was would fill here. All right. I can do it again. Uh, what if we undo it and pick a new map? Maybe somewhere else. Bright pink, that was that one? Yeah, I think this one is the one that I want. There we go. And so now the entire suit would be filled in in that area. And you know it's it, it's using the mask because it, of course, stops short of all the other areas that we don't want, right? And we could also paint this on and or, um, you know, just use like a masking stack. Um, there's a thing in here now called add mask stack where you can add multiple masks up on one already uh, masked out material. So like if I place it here, you know, it's got the fill, but I can add more mass to add grunge and, you know, curvature, uh, edge wear stuff, um, all kinds of stuff. So uh, definitely check out the Quixel guys because they're dropping lots of tips nowadays that uh, uh, could help you out in getting started with Mixer. So. Here, let me go back and see if I can answer a few questions because I, I know I, I skipped over and before we end the day, as I know, and now looking that we're hitting six o'clock. Uh, Mixer does now have groups. And I, I wonder if they, they might have added some of like the uh, selection sets as well. I think that's probably one thing soon coming within their their updates. So look for that. Because if you, if you save out... Uh, your material IDs, sometimes your material names will be in the file, but you won't see them as a specific color, but they are a material that is assigned to certain objects in your model. And then you can use that to put a specific material in uh, just by its ID name. But an actual color ID would be, as you saw before, just just like uh, just like this. It would be just like, you know, random fills, of high saturated color. Uh, to indicate, you know, um, material breakups and falloffs of different colors, right? Or materials that you would apply to the model. Yeah, it's it's far it's yeah it's far less buggy than Quixel Suite. Quixel Suite, I, though, I thought I would kill it as soon as Mixer came around, and I've actually kept it because there are still materials in it that I actually like. So. Uh, I hope this helps everybody, um, or at least inspires them. Maybe go build, sculpt. I mean, God, everybody's staying from home, right? We have like the most, I mean, this is like nothing for a freelancer. If you're a freelance guy or an enthusiast, I would imagine this would be your heyday to get started building some models. So happy ZBrushing to everybody. I want to thank you all for joining me. Uh, lastly, let me go and look back through the chat a little bit more because I, I know there were some questions that I might have peeped. Uh, yes, uh, Dota 
two hero. I am using two RTX um, twenty eighty supers on this machine in particular. Um, I have another sub machine, which is actually going to probably soon become my main machine, that has a single for the win three EVGA twenty eighty Ti, uh, and that's the the hard render machine. Uh, soon to have probably two of them inside of it as well. Um, doing some stuff for Unreal, uh, although I will say if you're using Unreal for any type of cinematic purposes, it actually renders quite fast, almost real time. Um, some render times even at 4K have been inside of like 5 minutes for like 6 and 12 second spreads or something like that. So um, please stay tuned because pretty soon as I build this out, uh, this Unreal environment, there will be plenty of props, characters uh, that I will be building for this project. and then. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to share it with everybody at the end when it's built, but uh, probably in the form of some uh, cinematic effort. Uh, and I'm going to try to make like a little small sci-fi homebrew film out of it. Um, so stay tuned. But uh, let's see. Any other last remaining questions? Uh, yeah, you guys order food out. Stay home. Stay safe. Stay out of public areas. Don't get infected. Washed hands. Don't put your hands near your nose. Uh, I wish so many of you good luck. I, this thing has hit our, our country, our planet, our human civilization so hard. I think uh, it, it's, it's almost bordering on tragedy, a, a full-blown global tragedy. But I want you all to stay very safe and um, just keep on the practice. And don't get sick. Keep your family and your kids and your loved ones close. And only socialize with those in your immediate, right? Because the more we get together, the more this thing has a chance to spread. And so even if just temporary, remember, hold your head high, go in grace, and be well. All right, guys. Uh, it looks like I'm, I've reached the time gate. But thank you for joining me again. I wish all of you the best and happy sculpting, uh, ZBrushing, creating, do it. <laughs> Bye guys, much love. Talk to you soon.